Well, nuclear safeguards are a series of checks to ensure that countries aren't diverting their nuclear material. And they do this through inspections. That's the most renowned way they do it. Uh, they also do it through materials accounting, so countries have to declare what materials they have, what facilities they have, and then the, the nuclear accountants go in and make sure that that, that makes sense, that that measures up. Uh, but increasingly the agency is also being much more proactive in using intelligence information from other states, particularly the United States, but also France, UK, Israel, other countries. It gathers open source information uh, that is in the open literature, in newspapers, magazines, government reports. There's amazing amounts of that material there. So the agency is taking a much more holistic approach to each state uh, to determine whether it's complying with, with its agreement not to acquire nuclear weapons. So the agency's moved away from this accountancy idea, ticking, uh, ticking boxes um, in a form to ensure material is not diverted, to a much more activists, if you like, look at what states are doing. And it's all designed to stop them producing nuclear weapons. So that's a major contribution of the agency to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons to states which don't already have them. The agency uh, didn't invent nuclear safeguards. In fact, that was the United States. The United States has a series of bilateral agreements with other countries in which it attempted to impose conditions uh, for the sale of uranium, for instance, or research reactors. And it would say to the other country, well, we'll sell you this, this material or these, this equipment, but you have to uh, report to us what you're doing with them. You can't sell them onto other countries. You have to permit our officials to look at what you're doing. So the agency took that model and then grew it. So essentially, the IAEA now is the organization globally that does uh, these inspections for uh, nuclear uh, proliferation, non-proliferation purposes. Uh, there's a European agency called Euratom which also does them but on a lesser scale and they've also handed them over to the agency. Uh, there's a bilateral Argentinian-Brazilian agency which does bilateral inspections and many countries like Canada and Australia which sell uranium also have bilateral agreements with their customers but it's the IAEA which really runs the international safeguard system so they are, they're at the hub of this this safeguards uh, network and it's they who declare uh, whether a state is in compliance or not compliance with its safeguards agreement. So they don't just carry out the inspections, they reach a conclusion and then they will make a recommendation if they find a state in, in non-compliance and there have been several cases of that. New facilities uh, can be difficult to apply safeguards to, uh, particularly the new models we're seeing of uh, nuclear power reactors, so generation 3 and generation 4 power reactors, we really haven't worked out what the safeguard system will be for those. So the agency is trying to uh, devise a means of safeguards by design so that when the plants are designed from the ground up, they can have safeguards in mind. The safeguards may, for instance, uh, require cameras to be installed. You don't really want to be putting cables in for cameras after the building's already been built, particularly a sensitive site like a nuclear reactor. So it's better to do this from the outside. At uh, the outset. In the old reactors, we had no choice. They weren't designed for safeguards and we just had to make do. In the new facilities, there should be a way of having them pre prepared for, for nuclear safeguards. So, that in, in some ways, uh, we're at a better, in better shape with the new facilities. Uh, with the old facility, we, we, we know really how they run and, and we're pretty confident we can apply safeguards to them. There is a problem though with facilities neither new nor old, but they're bulk handling facilities. So conversion facilities where you're converting uranium into a form usable in a nuclear reactor. Enrichment facilities where you're enriching the uranium. Uh, plutonium reprocessing plants. All those, we have a, they have a lot of bulk material going in and out. It gets stuck in the pipes. It's often difficult to make an accounting judgment on where material has been and gone. The agency still doesn't have a good um, handle on that problem. They're working at it, uh, in particular with Japan, which has a lot of plutonium reprocessing activity. But again, that's a challenge. And if we see increases in these activities uh, in states which don't have nuclear weapons already, then that's a, quite a challenge for safeguards to handle. Non-compliance is a, is a huge issue because it's only, unfortunately, been through non-compliance uh, episodes like Iraq, Iran, uh, that we have improved the safeguard system. It's provided the political impetus for change in the safeguard system. 
and unfortunately uh, it has in some senses called the safeguard system into disrepute. Prior to the discovery that Iraq almost had developed nuclear weapons secretly, there was a, an assumption that safeguards were working quite well, there hadn't really been major incidents, a few minor ones, so I guess there was something of uh, a lethargy apparent in the international community about safeguards. And originally they weren't designed to be 100% effective, they were really meant to be uh, checking up on a gentleman's agreement in some respects. We all knew that the safeguard system wasn't 100% foolproof, but we were hoping that states would abide by their legally binding obligations not to acquire nuclear weapons. Well, it turned out that that was probably somewhat naive, and there were states who were willing to cheat, and so we've had Iran, Iraq, North Korea, Syria as the major non-compliance cases. But fortunately all of those have led to uh, attempts to reconfigure the safeguard system, rethink the way uh, reports are done on non-compliance, to try and hone the system so that this won't happen again, and so that non-compliance cases will be handled better than they have in the past.